Razabani for IFL TV in association with MTK Global. With me on Zoom today, Mr. Matthew Macklin. Uh, Matt, Happy New Year, I guess. Yeah, Happy New Year to you too. I'm sure it's not too late to say that on the 16th of January. No, it's it's uh, the first time of the new year, isn't it? How have things been? I know we didn't catch up for a couple of weeks yet. I did promise you I wasn't going to bother you over Christmas and New Year's, and I fulfilled that promise. But um, I, don't, I didn't think I was going to speak to you in January being in a lockdown again. No, I've got to be honest. I really thought we were, you know, I thought we were making progress with the, with the crowd coming back for the Joshua fight. I thought, and even by then, I thought we were, that had already gone on longer than I thought. I thought we'd be so well out of it by now. But what can we do? Just have to, just, you know, control the controllables. Just get on with what you can. Um, and, and I think just focus on the positives. We're all alive and well. And, you know, some people aren't. So, you know, you just have to be uh, as positive as you can. Matt, what do you make of the, obviously, the government announced that elite sport could continue? Uh, football, all, all the sports can carry on as normal uh, with, with their testing protocols that they already have in place. What did you kind of make of the board's decision to say no boxing in January? Look, I think, I, I think probably what that was, was, you know, the NHS is already really struggling. And I thought, I think they're thinking, well, the last thing we need to be doing is taking more resources away, more ambulance men, more paramedics, and then God forbid, you know, something tragic happens in boxing that's that's even more pressure again so i think i think it's kind of you know i think they're just thinking it for the greater good of the whole country you know rather than you know what i mean being selfish i think they just think you know what we're okay let's let's just hold fire for a bit and let's let's try and work together and, and i think they just don't want to take the resources away from the nhs but i think also you know we have to try and you know, six weeks is still a, a fair amount of time. It's a mid affair, but and, and you know, th there are other things going on as well. People, you know, people people want to get fighting, don't they? People want to get earning. People want to move forward in their lives and their careers. So it's it's. I mean, it's a difficult one, isn't it? We saw last year where we were kind of all inexperienced in what was going on and the protocols and the procedures. Everybody knows now what to kind of expect, but. How tough is it for fighters? We saw last year with Savannah Marshall, Peter Fury tested positive. Um, we saw, that was on fight week, by the way. We saw Jazza Dickens, last minute fight week, golden contract final um, against Ryan Walsh. He tested positive, he had no symptoms. How hard is it for those fighters who are not earning those high level capacities where they, they're going through these camps and these training uh, regimes and all of a sudden they get to fight week and all of a sudden, someone's tested positive and they can't fight no more. Yeah, difficult, man. I mean, like you say, you, you, it's, it's your time, it's your energy, your emotion, your money. You're not earning. You, you, you're investing in yourself, which, you know, you, when you're paying for training camp, you, you, you're incurring expenses. You know, you're investing in yourself in, in where you want to progress and get to. And then for it to, like you say, I don't know, if you get injured, it's, it's a... It, and that's happened to me and, and you cost your money and your time and energy, like you say, and it's, it's difficult. It's, it's, you know, it's a real kick in the teeth, but to test positive and you've got no symptoms the week of the fight, that, that must be a massive blow. Um, you know, my heart goes out to all those fighters that that happened to and the trainers and all the other team and people that are part of it, because they all play their part as well. And they're all rooting for you and they're with you. So it's just difficult. It's just, it's just been a shit situation all round, but it's no one's fault. There's no blame. And, and even, you know, I know we ain't going to get into politics or anything here, but I mean, they've got a tough job, haven't they? Because no, there's no precedent for this. No one's got the, the blueprint how to deal with it. People, people, everyone's sort of, you know, learning as they're going and they're, and they're trying to cope and make the right decisions and trying to make as, you know, well-informed decision as possible. But, it's difficult, you know, I wouldn't want to be the one making the, the decisions. No, absolutely. But on the positive, obviously, Eddie announced five shows uh, yesterday. Frank Warren also announced uh, a show for, with Herring and Frampton. Um, I don't want to go into too much detail about all the fights on each card because I'm sure we'll catch up uh, before each show anyway. But any standout fights? And, might, and some of them might not happen. <laughs> <You know? laughs> 
Very true. Very true. Um, any standout fights for you? Yeah, I think, look, Frampton, Herring, that's, that's, that's a great fight. I mean, you know, Hampton gets the opportunity to become a three-weight world champion. I mean, listen, his legacy is cemented anyway. But, if, you know, if he was to go on and do that, he's just, he's just adding to it even more. So, um, look, it's a tough fight. But, listen, Carl's a really good fighter. So, he, he, I think he could do it. Um, listen, Dillian White against Povetkin in the rematch. Really looking forward to that fight. Um, I'll tell you a great fight that's probably gone under the radar a little bit is JJ Metcalf and Ted Cheeseman. I think that's going to be an absolute barn burner. <laughs> I feel sorry for Cheeseman because he's not going to have a long career at this rate. You know, every fight's a ding dong. I know that's his style a little bit, but Metcalf, that, that, that's going to be, I could see that being a brutal fight. That could be a fight of the year candidate. Any other fight? Obviously, we know Akoli, Gulawaki. Uh... Yeah, looking forward to that to see if Akoli can go, go on and become world champion. Hopefully he can. Uh, I think he can. Um, won't be easy, though. Uh, listen, Conor Ben, like I say, I always like watching Conor Ben fight because I think it's, um, I'm intrigued by his journey a little bit. You know, he didn't have much of an amateur background. Um, you know, he has big boots to fill there with, 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 with who his dad was. But I really, I really like his attitude. You know, I love his attitude and, uh, and I've seen massive improvements every time he boxes. So, you know, he's someone that I enjoy watching. Um, I heard you the, on his previous Josh fight. Warrington, Josh Warrington, another one. You know, I had Josh Warrington on my own podcast a while back and listening to his journey. You know, I know I've, I've watched his fights, obviously, but listening to him talk and telling me about his journey when he came down to Birmingham and he boxed, as, you know, the B-side for the English title on a non-TV card and to see where his career has gone to. Fascinating journey. And, it, and it's, uh, you know, you can't, I think if you listen to, if you were to listen to that, you couldn't help but be a fan and really kind of will him on now for the rest of his career. Um, what else we've got? We've got, we've heard, uh, hopefully it happens. It's been cancelled about 10,000 times. Josh Kelly, now Venetian as well, another great fight. Uh, which uh, I believe is uh, in in March as well. Mm. Yeah, that's another great fight. Like you say, it's been it's been uh, it's meant to have been happening a few times. So uh, it's in February. Yeah, but it's um, that's a great fight. I, I think Kelly will win, but I think it's definitely not a given. It's it, that's a it's a proper fight. It's a proper fight. Um, but I, I do think Kelly. I, th I think Kelly will. I think he'll he'll have enough in him. You spoke about Conor Ben there, uh, Matt. Uh, he's got some big shoes to fill. We've got Ricky Hatton's son, Campbell, making his debut as well on the Dylan White undercard. Um, big, big shoes to fill there in Ricky's, isn't it? Yeah, massive. You know, that, you know a bit more recent times, Ricky. But Ricky had a, I don't know what a career he had. Um, you know, Ricky, Ricky was a, a very decorated amateur. So even though he turned pro at 18, he was very experienced, you know, he boxed in the World Junior Championships, got a bronze medal there, got robbed, should have won the gold, ABA champion at 18. So he had many internationals under his belt. Plus, he'd probably been sparring with the likes of Pat Barrett and different professionals around Billy Graham's gym and, and um, the Collie Hurst and Muscle gym also. So when he turned pro, he was, ex he was quite experienced, really. Now, I know Campbell's, got, you could say, has grown up in the sport, but I don't think he, he took to boxing in the same way as early as what Ricky did. And he, he came in a little bit later. So he certainly hasn't got the same pedigree, amateur pedigree or experience as what Ricky hit, um, had. You know, and, and, and there is always that pressure because people make comparisons. They did it with Matthew, his brother. Do you know what I mean? So it's, um, and it's, a, you know, it's, it's, it's a positive and a negative. You know, I think there's probably doors and opportunities that will be open to him that wouldn't have been for someone else that, that isn't the son. So, that's a positive. But then you've got the negative is people are always comparing them instead of just letting the kid have his own career. You know, everyone's got their, he'll have his own pace of doing things and he'll learn as he learns. Um, so, yeah, it, it's, some people could say they're lucky and, that, and that's true. Like I say, that they're, they're, they are probably going to get opportunities and doors will open for them that might, maybe other fighters might not get that. But it's also hard for them as well because they're constantly being compared. And Matt, with Dylan White, we know after his loss to Povetkin back in August, he was very much wanted that rematch immediately. And, and they set that date in November. And a lot of people said it was a bit too soon to jump straight, take a couple of weeks off and jump straight back into training. But 
looking back at it now, do you think it's a blessing in disguise? And he's had more time to just kind of almost forget about the first fight uh, and just focus on training and get himself in tip-top shape. Yeah, I, look, I don't think it's a bad thing that it's been delayed for him. It probably is a blessing. Uh, that said, I, I think Dillian, it wasn't, I don't think it was a hard fight, for a uh, hard loss for him to get his head around. You know, he was, it wasn't like he had loads of mistakes in the fight that he's going, he's got to work. And it was a good performance from him. He was boxing really well. You know, he was winning the fight. You know, the, the round before he had him down twice. You know, he looked like he, he was on his way to stop him, Povetkin, maybe. He was boxing well. So, you know, the way he must have prepared for the fight, the way he, he went about the build-up and the way he executed the game plan at night, he, he did everything well. So there's not loads. You can't... It's not like you've got to go back to the drawing board and tear that performance apart. Look, he probably just lost concentration for a little bit. You know, that those body shots from, from Povetkin. You know, you could see he just tried to pull that elbow in to block the body shot. And, of course, he switched it into a left uppercut. It was a great shot from Povetkin. So it was a good move from Povetkin. And probably just something that Dillian's got to be wary of next time. But um, I don't think it's... It's not like he got beaten up badly and there's traumas there. You know what I mean? Or it was a bad performance. So you've got to go back and reanalyze and look how you do things. That wasn't really what happened. He just got hit with a great shot. So, you know, I think from that point of view, he's um, going straight into re an immediate rematch. I, 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 would have, I would have wanted to have done the same thing if I was dealing in his shoes. And uh, But look, yeah, it, no one can control the fact that it's been put back. And, and if anything, it's probably a positive. <laughs> Saying it's a positive, but is there a lot more on the line here now for Dylan? Because well, what I say, a positive, a, a blessing. You know, it, it, you know, I think he was always going to go back into an immediate rematch, but the fact that it's been a bit longer than was originally planned for November, I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing for Dillian. It just gives him a bit more time to not say get over the loss. Because, like I said, I think I think he just think, damn, I got caught with a good shot. But nonetheless, nonetheless, he was he'd have had he, he was in training a long time. You know what I mean? He trained all the way up for the first Povetkin fight. Don't forget, that was meant to happen. Was it May? Initially, that was meant to happen. I think it was May, and he got put back in July, and then all of a sudden, so, you know, by the time he fought him, anyway, he'd been in training a long, long time. So then to go, like, have a week off or whatever and go back into training again for November, it's a long time to be constantly training for a fight. So from that point of view, it, it, it might not be a bad thing because it just, he may have, you know, approached this training camp just with a bit of a freshness you know, to it, you know, not just physically, not just the physical freshness, but, you know, mentally, emotionally, just to switch off and forget about it. And then, like, right, let's pick back up now. And let's build up towards it. You never want to go stale training for a fight, but it can happen if you're in there too long. You always say one, one punch can change anything in, in the heavyweight division. Now, we're, we're definitely saying, you know, Dylan White's got a great chance in, in March, but is there so much more riding now? Is everything on the line here? Is his career on the line, would you say? Well, it, 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 you know, that, I don't know if his career's on the line. Like, I don't think it'd be the absolute end of the road if he lost, but it'd certainly be a long way back. You know, that, that, you know, he was, if he beat Dillian White, he was, got, he was, he was, he was, man, you know, he was going to get a shot at the WBC. Fact, like he was mandatory, you know what I mean? So, you know, in high socially, he pulled out and sat in his mandatory and waited until he shot. But then, you know, with Fury and Joshua, that being tied up, I don't know. I think Dillian's always stayed busy. I think it's been a good thing for him. So, why change now? But I just... <sighs> Listen, it's boxing. Boxing, it's snakes and ladders. You know, you get up there, you hit a snake and you're right back down. But then you can hit a ladder and you're straight back up. You know, that is boxing. You know, that you're as good as your last fight. You know, you're as good as your last fight. And uh, that's a good thing and a bad thing. You know, it's a bad thing when you're up there and you get knocked off your perch. But you can get back up there with one good win as well. So, Look, Dillian's, I've always liked Dillian's attitude. Do you know what I mean? He stayed busy. You know, he, he, he's took tough fight after tough fight. He's always backed himself. You've got to admire that, you know, and I think, I think and he's improved a lot, you know. So I think um, you've got, you got to respect the man's, uh, the way he's going about things. And, he, you know, he's never shied away from the fights. So I, I think Dillian will get there. Are you getting a little bit excited now that we're hearing that Joshua Fury could be close? There could be signing contracts in the next couple of weeks. Is there positiveness coming out of, of this scenario now with, with hopefully this big fight? Yeah, definitely. I mean, listen, that's, that's the fight the whole world want to see. The whole world want to see that fight. Um, you know, okay. it'll be, it'll be, you know, you just, 
you just don't want to get too excited, too ahead of yourself, do you? You know, you know what I mean? You, you just want to wait till you hear it's signed and sealed before you start getting too excited. But, you know, it's hard not to get excited when you're hearing all the talk of it. But, uh, you know, look, you listen to Eddie talk, you listen to Bob Aaron talk, and, you know, we're in the boxing business, so we hear things behind the scenes a little bit as well. And, look, it does look like the fight is going to get done. So, you know, we won't, we won't get too, too excited too soon, but things are looking good. Man, a lot of the fans were upset because there's a lot of talk about this fight not have, taking place in the UK. But with the current situation in the UK, does it make perfect sense this fight doesn't take place in the UK? Yeah, it, it does now. But I, I, I do, do you know what? I think if COVID hadn't happened, I genuinely do believe that there was a good chance it would happen in the UK. Because I think, I think even if it didn't quite generate as much money, it's still going to be a lot of money. And I think... I think both fighters know that really it should happen in the UK. That said, if it can't because of COVID, then that's a different situation, isn't it? You, you can't, you just, no one's in control of COVID. No one knows what's going to happen there. So we, you, you, you got to keep moving forward. So, you know, if it's in the Middle East, then so be it. At least the fight's happening. You know, and, and in fairness, with it happening in the Middle East, in terms of sort of TV time slots, it, it's actually a good time slot for the UK. It wasn't bad at all. It was probably prime time so I think that you know maybe the rematch will happen in the UK that could happen towards the end of the year probably because it's going to be a two fight situation regardless you know it could be a threat could be a third who knows if it's one apiece after two they've got to do a third <laughs> <laughs> no, absolutely but Matt do you think obviously Fury has proven that he can spend time out of the ring for a couple of years come back and jump straight back in big fights uh, by the time, if this Joshua fight happens in May and June, Fury wouldn't have fought for about 15, 16 months, whereas Joshua would have fought five, six months ago. Does that, does that have an effect? Does that have a psychological effect, physical effect? Well, you know, again, positives and negatives. The, the, the negative is you might not feel as sharp because you've been out of the ring. But then the positives is, well, you know, you're a bit fresher maybe. You're not, your body's not as tired. You're mentally, emotionally not as tired. You're constantly training all the time you know, grind you down eventually, you need a rest. But, you know, listen, they're, they're, they're consummate professionals at the absolute top of the game. They've done, it, they've done it dozens of times now, you know, these big fights. They'll know their bodies. They'll know when they need to step it up. They'll know when they need to ease off. Um, look, Fury came back after, was it two and a half years? After two really glorified spars, to be honest, to fight, the, uh, to fight Deontay Wilder. You know what I mean? To, to put on that performance that he did was unbelievable. But, you know, Joshua had a year out after Ruiz too, more or less. Well, it was, yeah. And, and, you know, I thought he performed really well against Pulev. He was a little bit apprehensive in patches. But I think that's very understandable with the year out and the fact that, you know, I think he's still getting his confidence back from the Ruiz defeat. I think he's got it back now, though. I think he will have it back going into this Fury fight. I think he's got it now. But I think, I think he probably needed the two fights. I think he needed to, to first exercise the demons of the first Ruiz fight and get the win. And he did what he had to do. And I think the Pulev one was a lot better. Still a few signs of apprehension. But again, like I said, that, that's very understandable. I don't think that'll be there now. I think when he fights Fury, he'll, be, he'll, be, he'll have to be a different Joshua. Anyway, he's not going to try and stand on the outside and outbox Fury. I'll be amazed if those were his tactics. I think, he'll, I think he'll take it to Fury. I think he'll be all guns blazing. I think he'll try and jump on him. And I think he'll be super aggressive. So, um, it's an, it's, you can get excited talking about it, can't you? But we just have to wait till we get it signed and sealed. Talks are 100 million each, Matt. Pocket, pocket change for you? Yeah. We're, we're talking pesos. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, well, let's hope the fight takes place. Um, Matt, I didn't speak to you, obviously, uh, after Christmas. Um, so I didn't really speak to you about Canelo's performance over Callum Smith. We, we, we said before the fight that the big advantage for Callum was his height and his size. He's, he's a big super middleweight uh, and he's a great boxer as well. But Canelo just made it look so simple. And it just yeah. shows how great he is. I think so. He, um, you know, the... You hear, I think when Maradona died and you heard all the tributes and Gary Lineker, I remember hearing Gary Lineker say, you know, he was unplayable. At, there was a certain point he was unplayable. And I think 
Canelo looks like that right now. You know, he's you know Mayweather probably was untouchable at a certain point in his career, um, and I, I, I think Canelo's probably untouchable right now. I don't, I don't, I really don't see who could beat him. I think, I think Billy Joe can give him problems because of his style. Canelo has struggled genu- generally with those sort of fast, slick southpaws. And Billy Joe's absolute top-notch slick southpaw, clever, you know, as well. So his movement. I think he gives him problems, but I just don't know of anyone right now, right now. This won't be the case forever, but right now, I'm not sure anyone can beat Canelo. From 160 to 168, or do you include the light heavy? Yeah, yeah, maybe even 175. You know, I don't know, could be Turby. I don't know. I, you know, he's that good. I don't think physicality, well, he just, listen, physicality, Callum Smith's basically a light heavyweight. You know, he's massive, so, and he's a really good fighter. You know, it just didn't matter. He, you know, he won easy, didn't he? You know, it was it, it just, you know, he couldn't really hit him. And then, and then, what, you know, eventually, if every time you throw a punch, you just hit fresh air or you get hit with a counter, eventually you stop throwing punches because, you, you know, every time you throw a punch, you get hit or you miss with five or six and you then they're on you. Eventually, you'll stop throwing punches. Then once you stop throwing punches, he's completely neutralized your threat. You're done. He's, he's took it away from you. Now you just dance into his beat. Now he's just dictating, controlling, just beating you up now. And that, that's what happens in there. They just feel like he breaks their heart, not through pain, like Mayweather did. Like Mayweather broke his heart. Mayweather broke Canelo's heart in the fight where he just felt like, oh, what, what can I do? You know, there was a point in there where he just, you could see, you could see he didn't know what to do. He'd run out of ideas and he was broken and beaten. Mayweather had him. That, that, that's what Canelo did to uh, Callum Smith. You speak about Billy Joe. Billy Joe has a skill to potentially cause him problems. But with Billy, we've seen his stand-up performance, potentially Andy Lee and David Lemieux. Since then, we haven't really seen that Billy Joe again. So what does it take for Billy Joe to produce that performance? Does he need a Canelo to show, showcase his skills? I think Billy Joe Saunders is somebody that boxes to the level of his opposition. You know what I mean? He'll raise his game or he'll fall to their standard. You know, I think Billy Joe needs to be scared to be sharp. You know, he's got the fear in him that he's sharp. You know, his movement, his speed, his reflexes, they're tuned, he's, he's switched on. If he's boxing someone that he knows he's meant to be and all the rest of it, he, he's not quite as sharp, he's not quite as tuned in, the reflexes aren't razor. So uh, his performances are hot and cold. But he will, I think he will be absolutely at the top and the sharpest he's ever been when he fights Canelo. And he will need to be. Is it going to be enough? a tough one to say to pick him isn't it but I think he's certainly got the style um, you know and not just the style he's, he, he's good you know he's the real deal he's got the speed he's got the, the cuteness the movement he's definitely got all those uh, attributes to, to give Canelo problems because Canelo has always struggled with that style but he's always got the win you know <laughs> he still beat them even though he struggled with the style he still finds a way to beat those guys so Look, it's a, it, 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 I think anyone backing against Canelo is a brave man in any fight this time. You know, at this point right now, he's because he's just he's on fire. I think he's the the number one man in boxing. Would you want to see that third fight with Triple G? Not really. I think Triple G shot, and I think they dragged it out as long as they could. They wait for they wait for Triple G to get old, and he still got rubbed. Triple G the first time. I think the second one was fair. It could have gone either way. I think, um, but I think the next one, if they were to box now, I think Canelo smashes him. Absolutely. Um, Luke Campbell a couple of weeks ago went out um, to Dallas to fight on to fight Ryan Garcia, and Ryan Garcia proved that he's more than just a, uh, a, a online social media celebrity he produced a, a great performance uh, were you impressed with what you saw from ryan yeah i was i was very very impressed because luke campbell is a top fighter you know olympic gold medalist you know razor thin decision against loss against um oh god not memory blank lenares mm-hmm. uh you know he could have got that decision you know that was a close fight and then you know even though he lost probably 11 rounds against Lomachenko. Every round, Lomachenko worked hard to win those rounds against Luke Campbell. Do you know what I mean? So the scorecards didn't really tell the story of the fight against Lomachenko. But, you know, Garcia, 
even though I thought it was a lot closer going into that, those, that last round than what the judges had it, I thought it, I thought that, I don't think they gave uh, Campbell enough credit for some of those earlier rounds. But the the tide of the fight had certainly turned, and Garcia looked mass. He looked like he did look like a matter of time. You know, he was in the driver's seat. I think I think it was at the end of the fifth round when he clipped him with that left hook on the temple. You know, I think. I, saw, I thought the belief, you could see, I thought, you could see the belief drain out of Luke Campbell then. You know, that was, he got hit with a heavy shot and the bell went, you know, and after that, I think Garcia just took over and he looked strong, he looked purposeful, he looked full of intent, he looked dangerous. And really, I didn't feel then that Luke Campbell had enough in him to really trouble Garcia. I thought it was a matter of time. With, with Ryan, everyone knew he had... A speed. He's shown great speed over his videos that he posted and, and his previous fights. But a lot of people question whether he had the power. I know Shane's done a couple of interviews and he has quoted in saying that we, we didn't underestimate his power, but we didn't realise how much power he actually carried. And that was a horrific body shot. Yeah, I mean, you, you, you see, you see, yeah, and even the left hook that buzzed him, that hurt Campbell at the end of the fifth. You know, you see him knocking out these guys. Sometimes you don't know the first round knockout. He's caught a guy... Not, caught them cold but you know what I mean you before a guy's warmed into the fight and he's caught them you think well all right he's really he's explosive early on he's dangerous early but you don't know if he's going to carry that power into the mid and later rounds but he certainly did and like I say he, he had some great wins against decent guys but Luke Campbell was a proven top guy you know so I, I was impressed I thought nah hype's justified there after that I could up until that fight I could I wasn't sure. I, knew, I thought, mm, he looks a million dollars against who he's been fighting. But let's see what he's like against someone like Luke Campbell. But no, listen, you've got you've to gotta give the credit where it's due. And it was a brilliant performance from Garcia. And I, I, I was very impressed. We know Teofimo Lopez is the undisputed champion. But how do you rate that division with Javante and uh, Devin Haney and, and Ryan? How would you rate the, them kind of four fighters? I don't know. Look, you, you look at the end of the day, Whatever way you look at it, Lopez is the number one because he's the man that beat the man. Regardless of anything else, that, that's what happened. You know, and listen, Lamachenko came back into the fight and maybe Lamachenko wants another go at it. But I think, Lama, listen, Lamachenko's not getting any younger, you know, and he's not really a lightweight. You know, he's probably a featherweight, truth be told, you know. Um, Javante Davis, you know, looked vicious with that knockout over Leo Santa Cruz. And not just that, I remember watching Pedraza, I watched him live against Pedraza at the Barclay Centre and I thought, whoa, he is vicious. You know, Pedraza is a good fighter. So, you know, I, I think that Javante Davis is right up there. You know, I think you've got to rate Lopez number one and maybe he's the best. But I, I think Davis is up close to that. And then just behind that, I've got probably Garcia and Haney. I, there's not a lot, which, you know, you're splitting hairs here. Really, I mean, look. I think Garcia and well, even Lopez, uh, Lopez, they're all young, aren't they? I mean, the, the the exciting thing about the lightweight division is these guys have got their whole careers ahead of them. These aren't guys over the hill. These these have got years in them. But I, I just think let's fight. Let's get the fights on, lads. You know, these you these guys are all going to be involved, hopefully as long as politics don't get in the way and networks. But there should be round robins. There should be rematches. There should be trilogies. They'll, they're going to move up in weight. You know, they, you really could have like a Hagler, Hearns, Leonard, Duran series here among this batch of fighters that could go down in boxing history as long as the networks and the promoters and the politics don't get in the way. Yeah, as you mentioned, the network and the, po and the politics. Let's hope they don't ruin these great big fights. Uh, Matt, just finally... Um, Eddie spoke about it this week. Um, I just spoke to Dave Colwell a few moments ago as well. Um, Brooke Khan, does that really excite you? Uh, no. No, no. I think they're both shot. I think they're both shot to bits. And it's just a cash grab if they fight. I don't think, I don't think either guy really wants the box anymore. You know, I don't see that. I thought, I thought when cash, I uh, thought when Cal for um, Terence Crawford. It was a cash out fight. I think it would have been a great fight a few years back, but I think when they did, it was a cash out. And I think Khan's done. I just think I don't think either guy really wants the box anymore. 
but maybe they, they don't want to retire either. You know what I mean? <laughs> because retirement's like, you know, now you've got to face the rest of your life. And it's, it's, it, it's tough retiring, you know, from, from something you've done for the last 10, 15, 20 years, whatever. So, but I, I, I personally, myself, doesn't excite me. I've got no interest in it, really. Um, probably would make money, probably would do numbers because they've both got big profile. But I think people that are kind of current in boxing, people, you know, the ones that follow it weekly, hardcore, I don't think those people are interested in that fight. That fight's three years past its sell-by date. You know, we want to we want to see Garcia and, and let David Haney fight to see who's the WBC champion. We want to see, you know, Javante Davis. We want to see Lopez. These are the guys we want to see fight each other. Okay, well, Matt, thank you for giving me a little bit of time today. It was our first one in January 21. Um, definitely not the last one. I can assure you of that. <laughs> There'll be many more uh, messages from me over the coming weeks as hopefully boxing will continue throughout the year and there'll be no stop, start like we had last year. Matthew McLean, IFL TV, thank you very much. Thanks a lot.